What do you say we look at yet another shelf? Let's knock out this little guy down here. This is the last uh, shelf on my, well, I guess I should talk about what's on the top. Maybe I'll talk about what's on the top too as part of this video. Here we have a book that was given to me as a gift, Versification, A Short Introduction by James McGauley. Product of Michigan State University Press. Nothing on the spine, which I think is cool. On the back, you see James McCauley, an expert in versification. Encouragingly, the book is quite non-technical in its exposition. It has an attractive little uh, table of contents, but I haven't read this book yet. I mean, I've dipped into it from time to time for like collage material, but I think today the, the chapter that most intrigues me is maybe other elements of variety. Like what kind of sprung rhythms could we talk, could we be talking about here? Have you ever known, did you ever know that you can turn a line of verse into a beautiful chart like this? Everybody go to it. I'll set this here on top of my rabbit angstrom book. The candle flame burns on. Here's my little water glass. What have we, what have we next? Looks like we have two very short introductions. So this is, uh, it's understandable why, why I would want both of these. Catholic, Catholicism, I was raised Catholic and I feel like I don't know much about it. Um, this is a cool kind of, I like an academic take. That's cool because it's, it's useful for people who are only hearing like churchy takes to get a, an academic take every once in a while. And then here we have this book on early music. This one's probably the one that's most delicious seeming to me. Uh, let's see what it's got in the table of contents. It looks like it's got some stuff about instruments and stuff. It looks like we're going up to Baroque. It's re I'm really interested in performing issues. I think, like in versification, I seem to be most interested in penultimate chapters. What kind of performing issues are we talking about here? All right. Da -da 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 -da. Oh yeah, there's lots of problems here. Many issues have to be considered. One of them is whether it is appropriate to play on old old instruments at all. Like why would we uh, go jam on them and destroy them by our playing? Stuff like that. Lots of cool topics in here. Well, if I should look at the penultimate chapter of this Catholicism book just to see what it is. Characteristics of Catholicism. Okay. I guess that's maybe, maybe like aesthetically or maybe more like loosey goosey stuff. Oh, it looks like my copy is like already very underlined. I wonder, I wonder if the previous owner of this book had like a spouse who was Catholic and need, they needed to learn about it before going to like a family reunion or something. Um, oh yeah, characteristics. Oh yeah, so it's kind of just like stuff to keep in mind. Maybe like themes that are held dear by Catholics throughout the world wherever you travel, maybe. Um, what are we talking about here? Oh yeah, Jesus and Mary, both a vertical and horizontal love. That's kind of cool. Um, yeah, I think this kind of stuff is problem is, is a lot of people trip on this, including me. Oh, I like this Burmese, um, uh, Madonna and child. So these are just like kind of athletic or, um, ac not athletic, academic explainers that are relevant to me. And I've been, I've kept them around because I do think I do want to, I do think I want to sit down with them and just use them as refreshers. Next we have... Go Tell It on the Mountain by James Baldwin in a mass market paperback edition that I got from, gosh, where did I get it? I forget now. But it's like a little, small, little Dell mass market paperback edition. And this is his first novel, and I'm really excited to read it because it's drawn, I think it's pretty autobiographical, and it's drawn on his own experience with like preachers and preaching and stuff. And I do like James Baldwin. The, the little bits of Giovanni's room I've gotten to see have been very exciting to me. And also I know he's a good music writer, so you already know that's up my alley. I wanna, I especially wanna read this one in another country and Giovanni's room, which is somewhere else in the house, maybe on another shelf. Okay, now this one is gonna make some of you jealous. We got some of you jealous. We got Pitch Dark by Renata Adler. Look at this gorgeous cover. The author of Speedboat, her books are reprinted by New York Review Books. We've got this nice kind of weathered spine. Um, what press we got here? Bantam, a nice just Bantam trade. And it's got a very plain back to it. It's kind of, it's kind of old, but it is not falling apart. This is a very readable copy. Um, wow, I never noticed that it has this. That's such a vibe, as they say. Oh, it is kind of falling apart on the corner there. I should be more gentle. Um, yeah, so this is the first Bantam Windstone Trade Edition from 1985, and boy, doesn't it, boy, does it look it. Um, so this is like a really, um, 
I've really always wanted to read her. I've heard that she's as as far as style is concerned, she's one of the she's a she's a big one. So I'm really excited to read this, but I still haven't read any Renata Adler. This is this might be a shelf where I have fewer things that I've thought about for a while. So this might be like a shorter video or something. But uh, basically, this is just a book I really want to read. It's a it's a to read, just like Go Tell It on the Mountain. But these are novels and editions of novels that are so good. It's kind of like if I can stand to keep them around, I'm going to, you know, even if it means a few more ounces in the moving boxes. Oh, and then here we have one that that has been considered a lot. There, here's Mansfield Park. I've loaned it to uh, Dear Ones, and they have read the whole thing. I read the start of it in this edition, and I think marked up the first 50 pages a whole heck of a lot. And I liked it a lot. This is one of um, Nabokov's favorite um, Austin books. What's this little slip? There was like a little slip in here. What does this say? Oh, I oh dumplings. This is another one of those ones where it's old and kind of dry, but it just holds together. There's like a, the paper's good. It's like a good batch of paper. Um, yeah, Mansfield Park, one of her longest books. It's not the one that I want to read next. I think I want to just go ahead and, and read Sense and Sensibility, which I have in an Oxford edition. Next, that's going to be my next uh, t uh, thing tackled by her. But the last time this was read by someone I loaned it to, it got these nice... Uh, lines on the bottom and it got this nice tear at the top or rather that tear had already begun but it got a little bit deeper so this is just a nicely weathered signet classic of mansfield park it's the kind of thing that signet heads are just going to drool about dude look tom jones henry fielding in the modern library college edition i can't be the only person who likes these um, this has pro this is probably in in my video that where i talk about all the like modern library books i have it's quite nice. Uh, I haven't read the whole thing. I think I only got like 300 or so pages in, and then I paused. What, where did I go? Oh, four. Looks like I got to about page 413. Um, but uh, this is one you really want to rewind and and read. It's, it's It really sweeps you up. I love the sense of, I love how kind of scandals will seem to spring up from nowhere and really spring spray everywhere you know I love the way scandal kind of comes about I like I don't know I like how I like how I like how this is as a romance novel I think romance novels should be this expansive and playful and um this is an exemplary novel for many reasons I'm not really equipped right now being at a distance from the book to tell you exactly why but I I can tell you holding this book right now that it's like gorgeous I mean it's just so good and how many pages is this again yeah it's like roughly 900 but yeah, these college editions are really lovely. I really want more of these college editions of like Faulkner books and other stuff too. I just, I, I kind of collect these. I have a Paradise Lost that you've probably seen that's in this edition. I have like the Swan's Way that's in this edition. I had one and then gave it to a friend and then got another one. But yeah, you y'all already know I love these Modern Library college editions. So there's that. Next we have Tom Sharp. The Great Pursuit. This is something that I just found and it just looked funny. I liked the cover. Uh, I think pan paperbacks, I've had good luck with those in the past. I think it's like a British thing, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because a pan paperback is what I have my, my Yates in. Um, my dad bought a book of Yates in Ireland and that's the Yates book that I have. And then I found this Tom Sharp book and it's just like a book, it's like a comic book about uh you know searching for a bestseller it reminds me of the like just recently i watched that movie the player by robert altman and um this seems to be you know like a book that might scratch similar itches it really is kind of outrageous here on the cover um yeah anyway uh i don't really know what to expect here i don't know if any of y'all have read books by tom sharp it's probably a name that's utterly unknown here in america maybe it's more known among people of a certain age in the uk but uh yeah this one's been tough to get to part ways with even though it's like not really like you know necessarily coming next on my to read list um just because it looks so good and it's so attractive as like a little package of a comic novel and i do think i'll probably have fun reading it so there you go, we got Tom Sharp's The Great Pursuit. And then after that, we have Trout Fishing in America by Richard Brodigan. 
And Richard Brodigan is this writer that my friends really liked in college and other people had copies of Trout Fishing in America that were in this edition and they were all like torn up to crap. And I think they might, might have just been floating around Hyde Park. Maybe a lot of professors got copies of this back in the day and then eventually got rid of them to like uh, to places. I, I like this writer. I think um, I already kind of like write like him whenever I kind of get a daily writing assignment. Like recently I wrote some words every day for 10 days at the start of June. I think that's like a, a common writing assignment that people do. And I, I, I feel like you kind of, things just kind of tend to be like little Brodigans. You know, like there's that thing that Billy Collins says where they're not novels, they're Brodigans. Like they're, uh, I don't know if Billy Collins says that, but I know he does the introduction for the, for the collection that has trout fishing in America and on watermelon sugar, of watermelon sugar or something. Um, that uh, Mariner puts out or something. Um, I think that like if you just write every day a little bit and let yourself start from a different place each time, you end up writing abroad again. Um, I wonder how many of these were like first drafts and how many of them were like third drafts. I want to see the Brodigan novel that like is most uh, is most um, revised. Anyway, you know I already like this kind of stuff and it's a little um, mass market paperback so I had to get it it's like my friend had the same book and it was falling apart and I was like ha, I, now I get to have one where it's not technically falling apart it's just about to here I broke down and finally got a copy of the road to Wellville this is definitely something that I could check out of the library and read this was really recommended by every like high school English teacher I had I've just heard that it's a very good book like I think several like like a good number of people have it as their favorite T.C. Boyle novel and um, I'm pretty sure that it's, you know, good as far as T.C. Boyle novels are concerned. It's the one I'm, if I was going to read one, it would be this. And then I'm, I'm a mass market head, so I got this one that has this kind of nice, it's like a kind of a tasteful movie tie-in edition with this nice design all around. Um, what press we got here? We got Signet Fiction. And uh, yeah, it's like, it looks pretty good. And, it, and it, I kind of like the way the poster fits in. Um, this x-ray is probably significant to the story. It's got a little bit of a kind of embossed thing and a little bit of a shininess to the letters. Um, I haven't seen the film. I would like to read the book before I see the film, though. Um, I don't know if anyone thinks the film is particularly good, but um, I definitely want to read this first. So anyway, just if you, in case you were wondering, this is the T.C. Boyle novel I'm going to get to next. Um, if I read a T.C. Boyle novel, it's going to be this one. I mean, it's the one that I'll get to first. Uh, on this shelf is A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man by James Joyce. This is the edition I read it in recently. I made a video about it. You can see it on my channel. Um, I'll talk about it more there. Uh, it was an amazing experience. I was just talking in the car the other day while driving to Chicago about how I want to reread this book. Ah, there you are. I've been looking for this copy of The Castle. Um, yeah, I, this is, I, I fail to see how you could do better than this cover of The Castle. Um... I really don't know what else there is to say. It's kind of awesome when they do the back of the novel this way. It's a vintage paperback. There, I think there's a whole series of uh, Franz Kafka's in vintage that have this typography on the spine. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I just can't wait to read it. It looks like it's got it's just got this castle on a rock. Um, it's it's just beautiful. Um, it's one of the thickest Kafka books I have. Um, I'm really looking forward to reading it. I feel like it's one of those gray areas where it's such a nice edition. I really want to read it, but it's also such a nice edition that I almost want to keep it pristine and not, not use it at all. But I know that that second impulse is kind of misguided. Like they're like, it's not like they're, they don't print copies of the castle. I will be able to find replacement copies of the castle if somehow this gets burned in a fire or something when I'm reading it over the fires of Mount Doom or something. This was the same. <laughs> I've held on to this D.H. Lawrence book. Now, if you know me, you know I'm not really super, super de duper um, impressed by D.H. Lawrence's poems. Um, when I open them up, I pretty much always am like, oh, like that's his poem. Like that, he, he that was what they saw fit to print. And I, I they're kind of humble. Um, like as opposed to just stuff by like Hopkins or something or. Or, or Elliot, where it's like, wow, like, look at this construction. It's so admirable. These are so, like, effusive and um, kind of little just um, ejaculations, um, you might say. And they, uh, I think I was really 
inspired to get this book because it was cheap and big. And I thought, well, if I wanted to read poems by him, this is my chance. And also I know he's influential to Dennis Johnson. So um, look at how concave the spine is. Like it's, that's so awesome. It's just like, it feels like something that would be on your like professor's shelf where you'd be like, oh my gosh, I've never seen um, that particular large penguin and I'm a large penguin lover. So um, this is so cool. And I can't even focus on what my professor is saying because I'm looking at this book and how did it get so concavey? Did he read it that much or did, did he or she read it that much or did they find it that way? Oh wow, this stack is really teetering. Do you want me to, you, you, you wanted to hear the page count of this? The last page of the book is page 1079. So there's that. Feel free to look at my, wow, it's really teetering. Feel free to look at my video where I had a little haul of books. I think it's called Book Acquisitions, Haul, Haul, Haul or something. And I talk about the circumstances uh, in which, the circumstances under which I bought that book. This was found in a little free library, not by me. But I do think it's interesting to me. It's by Iris Origo. It's Daily Life in a Medieval Italian City. I'm not sure um, how much of a novel it is or how fictional it is, but I don't think it's like super de duper fashion, uh, factual. I'm not really... Um, it's a recreation of the life of an, a medieval Italian merchant. So, um, oh, there's a portrait. Yeah, so that's the merchant, I think, right? Portrait, portrait of Francesco Dattini. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So we get so we get this picture of him on the cover, and then we get a recreation of his life. So kind of like a, a not a historical novel, but a novelish history, maybe. Um, and it's just a really nice copy of it. I wonder why someone put it in a little free library. I wonder if they got bored with it because it wasn't novelish enough. I guess we'll find out. Do, do y'all know anything about this Iris Origo? I... I I do not. All I know is that this book looks basically attractive. I always like it when two very different styles of penguins uh, co coincide on a shelf or in a stack. That's a very booktube-ish pleasure, you know? Now here we have a book that I've read plenty of. This is Part of Nature, Part of Us, and it's Helen Bendler's essays on lots of poets that I'm interested in and have wanted to know more about. This is a great thing to just have around. Um, I think I remember really liking her essays on O'Hara, Sylvia Plath. I think she, her estimation of Sylvia Plath increased my estimation of Sylvia Plath. Same with Wallace Stevens, who I basically couldn't stand before I read Helen Bendler about him. And now I, I can stand him. Um, there's nothing, I was always like, oh man, where's her stuff on Ashbury in here? But I think she has lots of other writing on Ashbury that's just not here. Wow, the lighting is very strange. And it's a beautiful paperback. It's a Harvard University Press uh, book. And it happens to be from uh, 1980. And it's a paperback from, from like 15 years later. Um, yeah, uh, just a, kind of a canonical, um, a canonical uh, uh, critic. I should read essays out of here and tell you what I find about them. I mean, there's lots of poets in here that we like kind of utterly have forgotten about today. Who reads poems by Robert Graves? Who reads poems by Howard Nemerov? Um, who reads po poems by Ellen Bryant Voigt? These would be really cool. If you could, if you could, M M Mary Boroff, Olga Bromas. Um, Robert Creeley is one who, that's kind of fallen, who's kind of fallen in my estimation. And I wonder if like I could renovate his readability by, by listening to what Helen Vendler says about him in this volume. His minuteness, his scrupulosity, his deliberate refusal of the expansive. I'm finding stuff on Creeley and Simic, two poets I've, you know, I've spent time with. Back here at the end of the book in this 10 poets section that seems to have little roundups of several books, like those roundups that used to be in Poetry Mag where they would re review, like, th like a, a critic would re review three books at a time, you know? Um, here we have stuff about him. Uh, what happened to her and what happened to her and what happened to her yeah this is kind of the, somehow when you see a poet excerpted in criticism they seem more legitimate i think that's something that ben lerner says really early on in the hatred of poetry that i just like took to heart um i was still quite impressionable when i first read uh hatred of poetry 
Charles Simic too is a minimalist. Here's a bonus area about Charles Simic. Charles Simic too is a minimalist of sorts, but he gives house room to intensity by his adaptation of folk motifs. That's cool. He gives house room to intensity. Pardon me while I commonplace that. It would be a really slick transition if she had anything in there about Denise Levertov. Yeah, so here we have poems 1972 to 1982. Um, I had a book of her religious poems that I gave to someone, and I don't have a registry of like my books, so I don't, um, so I don't know who I gave it to or where it is now. But I had a book of her like religious poems that was really great, and it has that one about Cademan, the the original um, poet. Um, I think that poem is also talked about in um, in the Hatred of Poetry. Anyway, that poem was talked about heavily in my high school. But I've got this like New Directions, Gray Spine, that, that classic kind of boring looking New Directions edition of po poems from her in a like period where I think she was like hitting a kind of stride. And I like her. I just like her. Um, I like the simplicity of her, sen her sentences a lot of the times. I like how ambitious and yet unpretentious sounding she is a lot of the time. I think Levertov is just a poet I can agree with. And I would take this on like a long bus bus trip through through Europe or something. I've never been to Europe, but I would take this on a long bus trip through Europe. Have I spent lots of time with it? No. It's a lot of poems, though. I mean, 250 pages of poetry is a lot of poetry. I mean, an, a collection of poems that's 100 pages long is a, is a very intense thing to get through. That's just what I've always felt like. That's my rule of thumb is that 100 pages is a very, very long poetry collection. 50 pages is like a normal poetry collection. Um, and then like 75 or more is kind of like girthy. 50 to 75 is kind of like a sweet spot where you feel like you get a lot, but it's not overwhelming. Something like, I think Geography 3 just tips into that, uh, into that range to use an example that Wendler talks about in Modern American Poets, Part of Nature, Part of Us. Cool title. Lastly on the shelf is The Magician's Nephew by C.S. Lewis. This book um, is one of my favorites of the Chronicles of Narnia. I read it in this copy um, as a reread when I was kind of toward the end of college, when I was coming back from Madison on the bus uh, on the Van Gelder. And I enjoyed the illustrations. I think I may have teared up at the end. Um, oh my gosh, yeah, it has, it has maps. Color maps. It has great illustrations. This one, I should probably reread it again. Because as far as imaginative writing is concerned, the kind of progress through a fictional, the, the like, the, 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 the great journey, like the, the plane ticket, you know, the, the plane fare, I want it to be this, I want it to get you this much space, you know, in a, in a fiction, I want it to take you this far away. Like when you read something I wrote, I want it to take you this far away. Um, this book has already, always kind of transported me. Like, not from the real to the fake, not from the real to the fictional, but from one's place in the fictional to a place far away in the fictional. And I think it's kind of, the, it's one of the gold standards of that for me. I wish I were, like, more t closely familiar with it. Maybe I should, like, reread it as habitually as I read things like um, Catcher in the Rye, you know? But uh, just a favorite book. And, you know, with, with that little red scholastic tag that's kind of, like, dog nod. Um, you know it's going to be a good experience. So anyway, that was the last low little shelf on this um, this down, little, little cubby down here. So I hope everybody had a good time hearing about this shelf, and happy reading. I've decided I'm going to do a different video for these books up here on the top.